If it wasn't apparent to you before that Nvidia pushed the RTX 4090 nearly to its limits from the factory, then after watching this video you'll definitely be convinced. I was so fascinated from these results and definitely wanted to share them with you because if you're an RTX 4090 owner, you definitely need to do this. Let's discuss that in this video. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here. Welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. Over the past couple of weeks, I've been playing around with the MSI RTX 4090 Gaming X Trio graphics card and I've been having quite a lot of fun with it. Previously, we checked out overclocking with this card. Link for that video will be in the description. But to say the least, overclocking was a bit underwhelming. Overall performance didn't increase that much with a few exceptions, but what this showed me was that Nvidia has already overclocked this GPU from the factory. The fact that even with the card sustaining 3 GHz under a gaming workload, which is about 300 MHz higher than the stock configuration, performance barely scaled with it. Fortunately, this really wasn't that big of a deal because as I had said in that video, stock performance from this graphics card was already quite stellar. And to me, this is actually a good thing because out of the box, you're already receiving nearly the full potential of the GPU, so it's not like you're leaving any performance on the table by not overclocking. Back in the day, and I sound old saying this, back in my day, but in all seriousness, something like a GTX 970 had a lot of headroom to overclock, and you could get it fairly close to a stock 980. Therefore, the general consensus was that if you weren't overclocking, you'd leave a significant amount of performance on the table, and who doesn't want to get their money's worth from a product or service? Now after doing my overclocking testing with the 4090, this then prompted me into doing tests with the GPU undervolted and along with that also power limiting the GPU. In the past, for all the Ampere GPUs I was able to get my hands on, I had shown that you can significantly lower your power usage and also lower thermals by undervolting your graphics card and barely lose any performance so your experience was virtually identical to what you could get from the card out of the box. This is just so beneficial because if you live in an area where electricity costs are high, especially nowadays with everything that's going on in the world, then saving every watt matters. Along with that, you do also get less noise and thermals. For quite some time, I had been using my RTX 3080 in the Cooler Master Q500L case, which is known for having poor thermals. This was my HTPC OLED rig, so lowering noise was vital for me, as I wouldn't game or watch a movie with headphones on. Undervolting helped me maintain lower temps for the GPU and overall system, which also helped me improve acoustics. How I undervolted and power limited my graphics card was quite simple. Just like with overclocking, I had used MSI Afterburner, but instead of using the core frequency, slider, I opted to use a frequency voltage curve. All you have to do to access this is press Ctrl F on your keyboard and it should pop up. When I had tweaked my 3080, 3060 Ti and 3070 Ti along with the other Ampere cards I could get my hands on, I would just use this curve to undervolt and leave it at that. But this time what I also did was play around with the power limit slider. Now I had ran two different configurations. For the first config, I had targeted 2700 MHz at 950 millivolts, with the power limit set to 90%. In addition to that, I had also overclocked the memory by adding a plus 1500 offset. In my 4090 overclocking video, I used a plus 1700 offset, thought I'd be a bit conservative this time around just to play it safe. For the second config, I had targeted 2625 MHz at 900 millivolts, which does sound low, but you'll be quite surprised by the results. Along with that, the power limit was set to 80%, and I had the same plus 1500 offset on the memory. I think when undervolting and power limiting the GPU core, overclocking the memory is crucial as that can help alleviate some performance loss. Before jumping into the results, I wanted to quickly go over the test system specifications. The CPU is an AMD Ryzen 7 5800X which has been overclocked using PBO2 and Curve Optimizer, cooled by an Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 360 AIO, and is paired with 32GB of Patriot Viper Steel DDR4 memory, which is running at 3800 mega transfers CL14. The motherboard is an MSI X570 Unify. For our storage, we have a 2TB Samsung 970 EVO Plus NVMe SSD. Powering the entire system is an EVGA G3 1000W 80 plus gold certified power supply. The operating system installed is Windows 10 Pro, as that is what the vast majority of users are still on. If you're interested in full system specs, check the video description down below. Let's start off with boost frequency behavior. 
Due to time constraints, I don't have data for frequency and thermals for the second config, so what you're seeing is the data from the first config where I targeted 2700 MHz at 950 millivolts. And as expected, during TimeSpy Extreme's second graphics test, the behavior is pretty much close to what we were seeing at stock, but we're seeing a little bit of a reduction of 45 megahertz overall, which isn't too bad. During our Shadow of the Tomb Raider test, we can see a similar behavior. I had explained previously in my 4090 review, since the game isn't as heavy of a workload as Time Spy Extreme's second graphics test, the frequency behavior is a lot more consistent. At stock, the 4090 flatlined at 2745 megahertz, while our undervolted configuration sees the card sit at 2700 megahertz. Moving on to thermals, and the results here are fairly straightforward. When undervolted and power limited, the card's temps barely improve. We dropped by a degree on the average core temp, and 2 degrees on the hotspot temp. Previously, when I had undervolted my Ampere graphics cards, I had noticed larger drops in temps, around 10 degrees. But I think the reason why we don't see that happening here is because this cooler is overbuilt for this card already. If the heatsink wasn't getting too saturated with heat, then undervolting wouldn't really be bringing down temps that much. The reason why the overclock temps are actually a little bit lower is because I had utilized a custom fan curve, but when it came to undervolting, we're already targeting a lower frequency, therefore a custom fan curve wasn't really necessary. The thermal results from an hour-long gameplay session of Shadow of the Tomb Raider also tell the same story. Temps drop by a few degrees, but nothing too drastic. This is fine though, as stock temps for the card previously were acceptable, so was the noise. My main objective is to lower power consumption for this card, not temps. Speaking of power consumption, we can see that for our first undervolted and power limited configuration, average power consumption has dropped by 10% or 43 watts, which isn't too bad. Along with that, the GPU only peaked at 404 watts, which is a pretty big improvement there. Before we jump into the gaming benchmarks, I wanted to quickly take a look at a 3D synthetic benchmark, and that is 3D Mark Time Spy Extreme. When stock, the MSI RTX 4090 Gaming X Trio scored 19,288. When we undervolted to 950 millivolts at 2700 MHz with a 90% power limit, the score dropped to 19,118, which is barely anything. However, for our second config where we targeted 2620 MHz at 900 millivolts, the score dropped to 18,000. 1528, which may seem like a lot, but it's actually only a 4% drop. Moving on to gaming, and the first game we're going to be taking a look at is Total War Warhammer 3, and I decided to do things a little bit differently this time. The reason why I didn't share power consumption figures for Shadow of the Tomb Raider earlier is because I decided to include those figures for each title with each different configuration. So we'll get to that when we uh, get to Shadow of the Tomb Raider later on. For these graphs, the left vertical axis represents FPS, while the right vertical axis represents power in watts. When it comes to performance, you can see that our undervolted configurations and stock config are all pretty much neck and neck. You're getting a virtually identical experience here. Where things change drastically is when it comes to power consumption. At stock in this game, the 4090 consumed around 385 watts, but we dropped that down to 329 watts for the first undervolted configuration, while performance is just slightly better. However, for our second config, where we undervolted to 900 millivolts at 80% power limit, we dropped 94 watts while keeping the same level of performance as stock. This is what prompted me to do an undervolt and power limit a little bit further than the first config. I wanted to see just how much more power we could save while keeping performance as close to stock. Really good figures for this title. The next game on our list is Forza Horizon 5, and surprisingly, as GPU bound as this game is, power consumption for our stock config isn't too bad, as the GPU only consumed 293 watts during a benchmark run. Then for our first undervolted config, we did lose a little bit of performance, but power actually doesn't drop at all. Then for our second config, there is an additional loss of 1 FPS, and power consumption only goes down by like 5 watts. So, if all you do is play Forza Horizon 5 on a 4K OLED, then you've got nothing to be worried about. In Hitman 3, we can see that when compared to stock, the second undervolted config cuts power by 46 watts. This game was another title where we see that at stock, the 4090 isn't really pulling that much power to begin with. Even when he had overclocked it, power consumption only went up by 11 watts. Nonetheless, we saved 14% of power while keeping performance relatively close to stock, so I'll take it. 
Shadow of the Tomb Raider is a game that does see fairly high power usage at stock, where the 4090 was pushing 399 watts on average. For our first undervaulted configuration, we can see that performance is identical, but average power consumption is dropped by 58 watts, so if you're satisfied with that, you can stop there. But if you want to significantly cut down power, the second configuration is where it's at. Dropping power consumption by 96 watts, nearly 100 watts, while performance sees a very minor hit. We're looking at 6 FPS for the average and 1% lows, which isn't going to be noticeable at all, especially in a title like this one. Red Dead Redemption 2 is another game where we can see the card pulling around 380 watts at stock. For our first undervaulted config, we can see that power drops by 55 watts, while performance is basically the same, which is a decent result, though it's the second config where the results are really impressive. Our average FPS drops by 3, while the 1% lows are basically the same, so that kind of performance loss is negligible, and what makes this result impressive is that the power draw went down by 25% and now the card was only pulling 287 watts on average. It's astonishing to see how in games like these, performance is virtually identical but power consumption goes down dramatically. Assassin's Creed Valhalla is a game that I think just loves the higher memory overclock because here we can see that both undervolted configs offer performance that's considerably better than stock and power consumption is lower but stock performance consumption wasn't really that bad to begin with. Still, we save power and we're getting performance, so that's a win in my books. Far Cry 6 is another title that showed similar behavior to what we saw from Forza Horizon 5, where stock performance and our undervolted configs show the same performance and power consumption is all very close, so we're not really seeing any benefit to undervolting along with power limiting the GPU for this title. Cyberpunk 2077 is a game that, as you can imagine, pushed the GPU very hard. At stock, the 4090 consumed 390 watts on average during our benchmark run, while attaining 75 FPS for the average frame rate and 51 for the 1% lows. Then for our first undervolted configuration, performance drops by 3 FPS for the average frame rate, but power consumption drops to 317 watts. But it's the second config which takes things even further by dropping power consumption to 278 watts, a whopping 112 watt difference when compared to stock and again the performance loss here wouldn't even be noticeable so that is a trade-off I'll make any day. Moving on and we have Gears 5, a game that pushed the RTX 4090 to 414 watts of power consumption for no good reason because we can see both undervolted configs significantly cut down power while offering similar if not better performance uplifts due to the 1% lows. They also make the overclocked config look like an absolute joke because the second undervolted configuration drops power by over 100 watts and is offering the exact same performance. The story continues with Control, which is a game that shows the highest level of power consumption for the RTX 4090, pulling around 440 watts of power during our benchmark run. Now, with the first undervolted config, we can see power does drop, but the card is still pushing over 400 watts. So I'm glad I decided to run these benchmarks again with the second undervolted config, because now the card is consuming 358 watts, but performance is again within margin of error. Horizon Zero Dawn is next, and I like this game because it's another title which is a great showing for our undervolted configs. Both of those configs show very similar performance to stock, but have significantly lowered power consumption. However, it's the second config which cuts down power to just 282 watts, which is a 23% drop when compared to stock. Doom Eternal is another GPU bound title that pushes the GPU pretty hard. When stock, the RTX 4090 consumed 411 watts during playthrough, which is definitely pretty high. However, when we undervolted the GPU to 950 millivolts, we see the card drop down to 348 watts, but performance does go down, albeit we're still pushing slightly above 300 FPS. With our 900 millivolt config, the GPU is right at the 300 FPS mark at 4K which is still perfectly fine, but power consumption is sitting at 308 watts. So it's another example where we cut down power by over 100 watts and still retain stellar performance. Taking a look at our 12 game average, and well, the results pretty much speak for themselves. Overclocking by raising the power limit, raising the voltage, increasing core clocks, just seems like a waste because you barely gain any meaningful performance while power efficiency goes out the window. What I will say about stock power draw at 372 watts is that it's not bad. Initially when we were hearing about all the rumors about this GPU having a high TDP figure, I was like, oh boy, here we go. We're going to have GPUs that will be pulling over 450 watts while gaming. But it turns out that's not the case. With that said, it's clear though that out of the box, this card is running well past the sweet spot on the efficiency curve. 
The real star of the show is our second undervaulted config, where we lost just a tiny bit of performance for the average FPS, which again is completely negligible, but we were able to drop overall power consumption by 71 watts. Going through the results, and I was absolutely astonished by what I was seeing. The fact that we're able to maintain performance that is very close to stock, like, you're getting a virtually identical experience, you won't notice that difference at all. But you drop down power in some cases by around 100 watts, even more, was fantastic. It really makes you wonder why Nvidia pushed this GPU as hard as they did. Had they just scaled back power a bit, this card would have been received so well by the tech press, and along with that, they might not have had to mandate that stupid 600 watt power connector. I'm sure you guys heard the news, so I'll talk about it in a different video, where a user's power connector or the adapter melted, which is just so stupid to me. But going back to the topic on hand, this is a no-brainer at this point. If you're an RTX 4090 owner, you should definitely look into tweaking your card through undervolting and power limiting. You're really not losing anything here when it comes to performance, and if you live in an area where electricity is expensive, then you'll benefit a lot more. Eventually, when I migrate this card over to my OLED rig, which is using a smaller form factor case where temps are going to be a bit harder to tame, then the second undervolted config is what I'll be going with as that will help me out there. So that'll do it for this one. I still have more videos I'm working on with this RTX 4090, so stay tuned for that. If you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching, take care and I'll see you in the next one.